Uh, welcome to another episode. My name is Prakar Gupta. I hope by now you're acquainted with me. I hope by now you're acquainted with the way I think. <clears throat> and I hope by now you are acquainted with the kind of problems I'm trying to tackle with this particular podcast. Um, and for those who haven't, for those who haven't figured it out, for those who have not made it obvious, part of my approach, part of what I'm trying to do is resolve the crises of information distribution in the landscape in the in the geography that i belong to so for now as far as i'm concerned with india i'm trying to i'm trying to actively figure out a way to get nuanced discussion and the ability to form responsible opinions across to people and in doing so <clears throat> what i'm at least beginning to realize is that there is there is more of a complication than i knew when i set out right so the guest i had for this podcast um sudanshu kaushik is somebody i've had on the podcast already i had sudanshu very early on i think in the very early days probably the fourth or the fifth episode was sudanshu and sudanshu runs an organization called young india foundation and what young india foundation seeks to do is it seeks to get representation for actually truly young people like the 20 year olds of our society in local level government positions and the first time we did it with the, for the first time i spoke to sudanshu i wasn't let's say i wasn't as convinced of what he was trying to do. I just thought it was an interesting conversation. I just wasn't as convinced as 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 I am now. And since then, since I set out on the journey to figure out what this information crisis that exists in our in our in our country is, I have found that the problem is far more complicated. And that is why out of an instinct born out of an instinct, I approached um Sudanshu again for a conversation. And as you will find through the course of the conversation, the reason why I approach Sudanshu becomes clear to me halfway through the conversation. The conversation is extremely rocky up until that point, and halfway through, the moment of clarity, the eureka moment strikes me like a lightning bolt, and I'm like Sudanshu, I understand, and I think you are right, and I think you are right in the sense that I think our leaders, our sense makers, our journalists, our activists, our politicians, our thinking class, our sense making class, is. too far removed from the real world to know what is happening and this sounds very counterintuitive right like you would want to say that it seems like the kids are too removed from the real world um and that the adults are still pretty much not on social media they're more you know but i think that is a fundamental shift in dynamic that we have failed to acknowledge the fact that the virtual world became more real than the physical world through the course of coronavirus and moving forward the fact that the virtual world has acquired such a massive say in what happens that it is almost it's not feasible anymore to pretend like the virtual world is just an adjunct to the real world and we sort of discussed that in the last podcast that I did with Vizakan as well but um in this conversation with Sudanshu I am taking the motion forward I'm taking the motion forward that there is a sincere generational gap and it's not just intergenerational it's also intragenerational it's that you and I possibly belong to our own insulated digital subcultures there where we speak our own insulated set of languages and we do not really come to a solution now i know speaking in abstract terms really does not cut the deal for for almost anybody so i'll speak in more tangible terms here is what i think is up with things like black lives matter george floyd in america or for that matter ca and nrc in india i think we have a unique problem in our hands i think the problem is that there is more than one elephant in the room but each of us is blind to all elephants except our own one the problem is that we are no longer talking about the same thing the problem is that when we look at the problem statement it appears in two very different versions of the same situation the problem is that the delta between how you see things and how i see things is too broad and the problem is that it's not just between you and i it's between me and everybody else and you it's 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 variated across horizontal lines and vertical lines it's it's massively massively segmented and the more the internet becomes a thing there is a statement i particularly like that social media increases variation social media increases the n there is so many variants of the same subculture and all of them have a different language and what happens when all of them get together to to appeal for a certain singular something is what is happening in america right now where a set of people with a variety of motivations where a variety of preferences of the order of motivations go on to the street to appeal for something that is genuinely a problem but 
because they are not organized, because they haven't figured out that the person they're protesting next to is not the same person as them. In fact, they're so different that their motivations might entirely be different at the protest. That things happen that were not part of the plan on one end. On the other end, it becomes very easy for the opposing side to whom only their elephant is visible to be like, oh, you are all bad apples because of that one person. We have lost the ability to first understand nuance and then to two, realize how much bloody nuance, how much insulated nuance exists in our society. We are no longer talking to each other. We are no longer talking to each other. We are, we, we, we are using very ambiguous, context-specific words to address each other in a universal fashion. When we say right-wing, well, do I mean somebody who's more on the right side of where I am on the political spectrum or more on the right side of what is generally accepted as the center? We have lost the ability to work through that kind of nuance. And because the online discussion, because Twitter has made it so easy to write and forget, we are in a constant state of chaos as far as the more real virtual world is concerned. And that is a problem that I'm beginning to unravel. That is a problem I'm beginning to walk towards in, in solving. And I think uh, part of it begins by understanding that the virtual world is a unique, separate entity that needs its own rules, that needs its own understanding, that it has almost very little to do with the real world, that it must be treated as an independent object first and then an associate to the real world to make sense of it. Um, and on the other hand, I'm trying to understand how exactly different how different exactly are we how is it how how novel are these subcultures how non overlap are these subcultures how different is exactly the person sitting in front of me and the attempt i made to do that is with with sudanshu particularly was in the political sphere he's been discussing the concept of um, gerontocracy uh, of ageism for far too long and i wanted to understand if it really is that deeply embedded and from what it sounds like from Sudanshu, it's not just embedded in, say, the, 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 the ancient legal code, the, the legal code that we haven't cared to revise up until, but it's also deeply embedded in the culture. And so this makes for a very fascinating conversation. Because initially, both Sudanshu and I are unconvinced of each other. It is only a while later that we begin to get warm to each other. It is only after some friction that we begin to understand each other on the same plane. And it sort of becomes, in a very meta sense, illustrative of the problem, that even though we are very close to thinking the same thing, we are extremely frictionful. There is too much friction between us until, you know, the necessary steps, uh, the necessary articulations, the necessary, the necessary condensation of ideas happen. I'm glad you're on this journey with me. Uh, let's see you on the other side of the intro. Thank you so much for watching. To like content, chahiye. bro. Yeah, are, hada, if you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing this right or what? <laughs> right or okay, all right. I'll give bro, you that. You, you have no idea how little margins I have for uh, stupidity that I don't plan for. Like I am, I I'm content with the stupidity that I do in my life. I'm genuinely I have no problem, right? But when when something like an uncalculated error gets passed, it's on some 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 deep psychological level it just does not sit down well with me that's why i'm just a little you know itchy about let's get all the record features on is the audio quality all right and shit like that you know i i don't have any um psychologists that i know huh. but i do suggest seeing one i think there i usually problem. just get a girlfriend when i have that kind of a problem <laughs> and i see why they keep leaving you <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, okay. You know what? Uh, that, was, that was pretty close to the heart. No, it's not all of them leave me. Some of them I leave. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> is that what you tell yourself? Nah, man. You know what? You know what? I used to think up until very recently, I used to think, I was like, I don't even know what it is like to be dumped. Yeah. I was just like thinking about it one of these days. And then like a week later, I did get dumped. And I was like, eh, you know, it's the I hope same. She sees this. Does she, you think she still watches your podcast? Um, I hope she's secretly consuming my content. I want that woman to be, you know, she missed out on something. Let's be real. No, most she did people, Most people, most no, she people didn't. have a problem. <laughs> she is much better off. <laughs> she's happier. She's living her life. No, yo, yo. I, I am. No, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, like, of course, you were 23. You were 24. Like, the world awaits you. It's only mathematically more practical that you make a call like this if you're incongruent. You know what I mean? And so... Absolutely. But 
I think so many people have this problem that they do not think they are the prize in a relationship. You know what I mean? Have you had something like that? <laughs> are you basing this off the conversation we had like no, two no, weeks no, ago? No, where no, were you talking no, about how we both you, got okay. dumped? No, 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 no. You are you are forgetting how many people text me every day about issues of this nature, right? I get so many text messages of people telling me I am in the friend zone of people telling me that um, I got dumped and I cannot get over her or I broke up. And in all those case scenarios, it's like, hey, you are 20, you are 21. You have the world in front of you. You don't think you were, you think you were valuable because you were with them. You, you know, don't I think just- you're... I just want to reiterate and clarify that I am not one of the people who text no, no, you definitely. to the audience. <laughs> I would you, never. You have a private line to me. You text I, me anyway. <laughs> I do not ask advice on a relationship basis or any other advice mm. from Rakhar. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe once. Maybe once you hit ten thousand. Uh, oh, is that followers. all it takes? So don't you come on, bro. Hey, as soon as you get the link sharing, you're you're godsend. Mm, okay. uh, I hear that you. Is, I hear that you. is symbol. Okay. That's like it's like Blue old thing. money, new money. Like huh. so, you know what? That is precisely what I wanted to talk to you about. I understand that you approach the world or the concepts that we are going to talk about far more seriously than I do. I think you are in general more serious than I am as a person, right? So, which is great. But I think the implications, the softer implications of what you talk about right now have harder implications in the future. And I'll make this less ambiguous right now. I think this idea that a blue tick or a swipe up feature is sufficiently important for one cadre of this community and absolutely senseless and baseless to another. What the hell is happening? Like, how do we make peace of the fact that something like this could exist with so much absolute polarized you know, Look, before even coming to that question, I just want to clarify one thing. Um, I don't think uh, I'm more serious or you're less serious. I think that you are verbose. Uh, you love jargon. And I think that's something that you really not only pride yourself in, you're good at mm-hmm. um, and discussing these issues. Uh-huh. Whereas I think I am less so into that and more so mm-hmm. into... Uh, actively organizing, actively mm-hmm. trying to find creation. So, you know, you won't see me discussing, unless it's this podcast, of course, because you asked me to, <laughs> right. um, about the theoretical concepts of ageism, gerontocracy, whatnot, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, right? What you will see me doing is working on trying to make political participation accessible um, right. and local level elections, right? Mm-hmm. That is my way of trying to fight uh, ageism, gerontocracy, etc. Right. Um, so, yeah, I want to clarify that, that it's not about that. It's not about no, last no. year's experience. Of course, I, think I, mean, it's I like, understand that. I, I, the way I would say it, and I'd add one more degree of like, let's say, vulnerability to it, is that I am in the process of figuring out what my question to life is. So probably you have, and you are, you know, working at the forefront. Part of my journey is trying to figure out. So when the first time we met and you spoke about ageism, it registered with me. But I was like, this is another one of those isms. And I am not going to spend time investing in an ism that is not actively part of the problem that I'm trying to solve. You know, in the sense like, this is foreign to me. I understand that this could be a thing, but is it really? But since then, I have come a long way in understanding uh, the patterns in which society is operating, especially the ones that we are seeing in this moment. And I think in some way or the other, this aspect of a massive generational chasm has enticed me enough to revisit ageism with you in some sense. You see what I mean? So uh, in that vein of thought, I may be more theoretical. I am still trying to conceptualize the problem in front of me because I don't buy it at the face value at which other people tell me. I have, that's just my personal notion. So um, tell me, um, what do you think about, what do you think about this just two different worlds of communication? So uh, just, uh, sorry, because you keep saying all these things that I want to like talk in and kind of- Okay, you know what, that's Uh, fine. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. So what, one thing I just want to say is that uh, you're right. You're absolutely correct that this ism, ageism, is mm-hmm. absolutely different from any other ism that is there. Or, you know, it is one of the other isms, but it's different in the perspective that it's the only ism, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, quote, unquote, ism that you can actually grow out of. Mm-hmm. If If we talk about sexism, you know, gender is something unless, of course, you know, you don't kind of prescribed by that gender identity mm-hmm. um, that you don't kind of grow out of, right? You're always going to be, and I'm just talking specifically 
in a male, female, I'm not going into right. other gender identities, um, just for the simplicity of this conversation. Um, it's something that you're, you're born with and you are a male or a female, etc. Um, same thing with, let's say race, right? Racism. You are born in a race and you don't grow out of that race. Um, you know, same thing with, let's say casteism. You are sadly born in a caste, um, that you have, you know, and then everything is decided for you on the basis and presumptions of that caste. Um, age is something that you grow out of. So the implication is, is that ageism hasn't been that well explored or has been a persisting issue because it's, if you're too young, right, you'll grow older. It And the only, like, I think, the only instance that it's been put a lot of research into is at the older, right? So ageism is both for the young, but also for the aging demographics. So many researchers have looked into ageism when it comes into nursing homes, when it comes into aging and seeing how they're being taken care of, et cetera, because then technically you're growing into that ism, right? But ageism in the, you know, the opposite spectrum when it's, when you're too young, when people are, are, you know, biased against your age because you're too young, it's not of an urgency. Re, uh, until quite recently, um, because of the fact that you'll grow out of it. Abhi to butcha, but you know, teen sal baad, char sal baad, paan sal baad, you'll grow out of it. Um, that I think has been a key instance of why it hasn't been explored. It's why people aren't talking about it. But, and I think this will go into what what you're kind of looking into is what you said. There is a generational shift and change, and because of social media or whatnot, all these other factors playing in part, you have a lot of pressure from young people, right? That normally would be you know put into a box, uh, wherever, etc. Um, now you have them pushing at it. You know, mm-hmm. I you know there's uh, people refer to the glass ceiling in terms of you know uh, women. I refer to mm. another concept of glass ceiling when it comes to young people, right? Mm. Um, young people not being able to participate politically, whether that's in India, whether that's in the United States, young people not being able <clears> to <throat> you know, access resources that they're meant mm. for, or young people facing discrimination on the basis of their age. So young people are trying to you know, take one stab uh, at a time at breaking that youth glass ceiling. Mm. Mm. Um, and we need to constantly keep doing that. And yeah, so like every move you make, is mm-hmm. one stab at that youth glass ceiling. Right. Here's what's... Okay. I do understand that we can begin with drawing a single line, but it gets a little more complicated, this whole idea of... Um, because it, it does not seem like social media or the young can be grouped into one category at all either. In fact, some of the most vehement... Like some of the stuff that I cannot sit with, some of the most disgustingly... Um, I don't even know, like... Some of those, some of those memes come from extremely young people. In fact, I'd say the more most of the internet or friendly, extremely old people too. Oh, for sure. But like, you know, old have you seen Subramanian have... Swami? Have you followed him on Twitter? <laughs> Subramanian Swami is quite a cat. But here's what I'm saying. My my point is, old people are not effective on the medium of social media. The 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 kind of memes and the kind of like. The, it, it's interesting to me that the more internet friendly young people I meet from India, the more radically conservative. There is a term for it. They call themselves strads. Like I've seen some weird music and artwork mixed with like, um, there was this, this Instagram channel where they had explicitly extremely Hindu content, not, not in um, a culturally Hindu way, but more like a politically Hindu way. Uh, and it was marketed as such a jazzy new age kind of a thing. And the general point being that it, I, I think that there is more than just youth pushing the boundary up in, in one direction. I think it's just in so many weird directions. And yeah, that's never been an argument. That's never being like uh, that young people are all, let's say, politically woke in right. a liberal perspective. Right. There's so many young people, um, you know, people that I've encountered, people that I've researched, worked with that are, you know, pushing what you're saying, those boundaries, but in different ways. People mm-hmm. are reclaiming their caste. You see this reemergence of caste identity uh, far greater than, let's say, the 1990s and 2000s in a way. Um, you see, and pushed by young people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you see, um, you know, and I, you know, profiled this uh, this group in Haryana for my book, um, and they're, you know, the Brahmin Yuvasena, right? And mm-hmm. they're basically like, Brahmins who feel misplaced in their identity, blah, blah, blah. And they're all young people, 
uh, I'm talking about, you know, 20 to 25, and they're talking about how Brahmins have been, you know, pushed to the side in India, but specifically Haryana, and -hmm. they want to reclaim that identity and this and that. And you're like, wait, so you're a law student at Kurukshetra University, or, oh, you did your LLB and like Panchkula, et cetera. You know, they have the iPhones, they have the TikTok using stars, but they're using that for their Brahmin identity. And you see that in many other aspects. This is just one example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I 100% do not agree. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's actually ignorance and arrogance from one perspective of the side, thinking that all young people are politically liberal or mm-hmm. pushing this side just because we surround ourselves with our Instagrams. There are of course. quite innovative, uh, actually, individuals and identities and groups that are pushing the other side too. But, right. but the overlining picture is, is on both sides or all sides, whatever you want to shape it, people, young people are pushing. Mm-hmm. And I and I agree, you know, and 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 so here is another layer of complexity. Let me just add, right? So we have now sort of established that it's very evident that there's liberal pushing and conservative pushing by young people on social media, and moderate I, pushing, and and moderate pushing and all, political pushing. Let's just call it that, right? I was speaking to my, um, I was right before we got on a call. I was speaking to my younger cousin. He's ten years younger than I am. We were playing uh, Fortnite together, and I usually interact with him because. When I speak to him, I realize that there is a whole world out there that I have just never wrapped my head around. And there are words in these worlds that I have never really understood what they mean. So I was, I was playing with him and another guy joins our party and my, my younger cousin's like, dude, this guy's sweat. And I'm like, sweat? Yeah. What do you mean sus? Sweat? You're sus. Right? I get, like I, I've been hearing like a lot of these like Gen Z's like sus or like this. I'm like, can you not spell the entire word out? <laughs> and how, how far out are you and I extremely internet savvy people, extremely socially active people away from this Gen Z. My point is, how does this linguistic fissure just appear out of nowhere? And he was 12 last year. Where is this language coming from? I'm so surprised. What do you, what do you think about that? I think we all have a, and I guess it has to do with age at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, we all have our generations um, and we have, regardless of what you might think about high school, your education been molded within our age bracket demographic, right? Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. what you're saying, the, you know, 11 year old to 14 year old, I I don't know the specific demographics, but I'm just saying, right, 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 right. Like Mm -hmm. that generation is adapting, evolving faster, quicker, sooner than all of us. Right. Um, And, you know, and this is scientifically proven um, it was in some neuroscience magazine, and we actually used that article to approach uh, one of the high courts um, in terms of our litigation and PIL, mm. is that the development of the human brain, right, has significantly increased. So let's say the 10-year-old now is significantly, I guess, more aware, smarter than like the 10-year-old in like the 1900s, et cetera. It was some study that was being done. Mm. And it seems that way as well. Um, maybe not necessarily more developed, but more conscious and aware. I mean, I look obviously at my own family, my cousins, and they're like brilliant. I'm like, what the hell? Like if, you know, and I, and I work with a lot of young people and I see that, that demographic bracket where there, there are these, you know, people that are just going into freshman year are incredibly intelligent, incredibly smart. I'm just like still making typos where they're like, you know, like complicated Sporting software so nobody will ever get <laughs> typos right yeah like, i mean just like it's, it's it's like it's incredible to see that but i don't think it's necessarily um I, th- we were going through that you know of course yeah yeah we, we were going through that like right. I remember like i don't know i don't know if this is something uh, of your pertinent but we had cultural fads and like awareness and maybe it wasn't as as being woke as possible because there were limitations Kony that, 2012 you remember that Oh, I completely remember that. I actually yeah. took part in it substantially and faced right. a lot of criticism right. um, regardless. But yeah, I mean, even even before that, after that, and not as serious as that either, not politically, societally that you're you know engaging, but right. even in your daily lives, what you're talking about, these words or this, like, you know, we still had swag. Like right, right, right. our generation was the one that really- YOLO. Like, yeah, swag, right. YOLO, et cetera. To everyone else, it's like, what the fuck? But right. here- um, you know, and that's the same thing that we're happening. So I think that's just a, you know, uh, that's like, so you know how you have cultural differences, you won't really catch on. I think these are like, you know, generational differences. And um, we used to think more so in the, oh, we're being limited by our older generations, especially like first gen and second gen Indians who, you know, shifted here as Indian Americans. Um, they would have that cultural difference and generational difference. Um, but at the same time, we have it with people that are younger. And that's that's the test of time. It's always going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. That's not going to change. People are going to be adapting, evolving. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's that's part of society. It's nothing too... Um, I think it isn't prophetic in terms of 
oh, that showcases something. I think that's just how life is and how we interact with culture and society. Mm -hmm. uh, every demographic will have a different set of like For sure. ways, identities that they prescribe with. Right. I mean, and I'm with you on that, right? The, the way I say it is that every time my dad's AC would stop working, he'd call me to find how to operate the remote. And every time I need a new Discord server put up, I'm going to call up my younger cousin. Like the, the, the difference is... I was the guy who was technically adept at one point. It is just that technology was way faster than my awareness was. And so, you know, automatically the inheritors of natural access are my, 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 my younger cousin. They understand automatic. So, I mean, uh, I agree as far as w w the fact that this is going to happen is, is an agreeable concept to me. But I think what has changed, firstly, is that it's not just that there is only two levels of complexity. It is that there is N level of complexity. Like there is, there is so many social media promotes variance in culture. There is so many subcultures, which have so many subcultures, which have so many subcultures that can remain insulated long enough for them to never talk to each other that we create an extremely, like a very, very novel kind of a situation. And with that, there is a difference between the people who are relevant to that set of culture and the people who are making laws for these people. You see what I mean? Like the fact that everybody in America who was in the race to become a president was over 70 something years. The fact that all our leaders like you contest in India are way too old to be leading a population that is so inherently complex within itself. Right? Right, so that's no a societal idea. thing, right? It's not a social right. media thing. I think more so social media um, has so much. Social media is facilitated. Well, mm -hmm. I would say it, if not built um, bridges, because I think that would be way too um, nice of a thing to say about it, an optimistic <laughs> thing. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think what it has is shown transparency because we were always developing subcultures upon subcultures, right? Um, we stick to what we know. We stick to what we're comfortable with. But for the first time ever, I as a, you know, they see can look into what black Twitter is doing and the trends that are going on on black Twitter and understand the lingo, understand what the issues are. And if not, you know, completely comprehend, at least be aware of this is happening. That's mm -hmm. only because of, I pr trust, trust me, like of, of social media, there is no academic journal that I can f figure out. Um, there's no, um, you know, like I couldn't fit in into that culture um, that's just because of social media and the access and transparency that it's given to you to be able to connect what, what you're saying, these subcultures, but those subcultures already existed. Hmm. Hmm. Um, let me try and formulate the question a little better. Maybe I did not do justice to that. So I think that um, we can no longer be looking at social media, especially after coronavirus and what has happened as an adjunct to the physical space. I think it has become a space unto itself in the sense that it has rules and principles and premises of its own operation. But it shares this weird kind of a relationship with reality. And that because we are not taking this virtual space seriously enough, we are in the middle of way too much confusion in some sense, right? So the general idea being that now these subcultures could bring their communities, no matter how far they were, home literally in a sense where they could play with them and never have to go outside or like you do, you know, you transcend your in-group, you go to these other places and figure stuff out. But the people who are supposed to make sense of this have no idea that this exists at the bottom. You see what I mean? There is a massive disconnect between. Do you think who are so? Because uh, mm -hmm. what Donald Trump does as a 75 year old, or I don't even know his specific age is absolutely trying to get into those subcultures over social media. I mean, you know, it's pandering the base, but it's inciting, you know, okay, think about it this way. A lot of your viewers are in India. When Donald Trump first came uh, to the United States um, as his visit, um, I think in March, what did he do? Before he landed, he retweeted two uh, uh, basically mentions. One was a Bhobali uh, remix of him, you know, trashing everything. And he retweeted that and it got like 30,000, 40,000 retweets, et cetera. Now that, you know, excited, incentivized, not just, let's say the Telugu community. Um, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it was like, Oh, like, you know, this is, uh, this is Donald Trump. Right. And that's a meme that he was sharing and it worked. Right. Mm -hmm. Same thing. He, you know, Ivanka and Trump, uh, quoting Diljit Dosanj, et cetera, and, and, and bantering with him on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Right. They completely understand the game. I wouldn't say they don't. Um, mm. I think that what you're kind of referring to mm. is the natural, um, 
perspective because we're so, I think, blindfolded by our own silos uh, mm. on these communities that we build that we think that, you know, um, this generation isn't necessarily understanding it. Mm. Whereas it is actually that many, not all of them, obviously, your grandmother, my grandmother, probably not, right? And my <laughs> grandmother just started using an iPad. But right. there is a class of people, specifically the political class that you were referring to, that mm. truly knows and understands how to in- incentivize, to excite, to provoke, evoke, mm. all the you know adjectives that you can kind of think of um, mm. um, to really, really get these people going. And mm. it's not in the same way of, let's say, doing pretentious mm. podcasts, right? But mm. it's in the same way of you know sending a, a shit-ass good morning message but hmm. with, you know, a round picture on it. And that hmm. incentivizes, incentivizes um, people to really get out there. Um, hmm. And this has been done before as well. So um, just as a, you know, the group that I was following, um, and I hmm. think this is, uh, I talked about this a little bit before, the Brahman Parshuram group, uh, hmm. they modeled themselves after another group that was created in the 1990s called the Parshuram Sena, right? Seva hmm. Dal. Um, and it was on the same premise, but the thing is, is now these, the BPSO is what they call it now is more active on social media. They're, you know, they've got the young guns, et cetera, whatever. Whereas the Prashuram Seva Dal, which was the precursor was also done by a generation before them at the same age, doing the mm. same thing, Brahman identity, blah, 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 whatever. Um, mm. Their way tactic was doing padyatras, which got people going. Their tactic and manipulation was basically taking and they calendarized, um, so Parshuram is like an idol, a Bhagwan in Hinduism, etc. Um, right. But he is like the go-to deity uh, for um, Brahmins. Brahmins, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that kind of was lost. And basically this uh, group um, really made it a household name using calendars and images, copying them and giving them uh, for free in um, Brahmin households, right? Mm-hmm. So Parshuram Bhagwan became a household name with them doing this kind of tactic. Um, mm-hmm. That, again, is a tactic they were using um, at their time with the tech that they had, right? So they know their community and, and they knew what they were doing. So I would say, and, and they still do, in, in, whether we're talking about Donald Trump, whether we're talking about Narendra Modi, but those are just very generalized examples. Look at Subramanian Swami. Mm. That man knows how to literally, if you look at his feed right now, if you look at his YouTube content, etc., cetera, um, mm. He has so many different uh, social media channels slash websites, news organizations that are doing the same propaganda that he propagates, right? And they all come back to him. And the thing is, though, is they've been able to find this, I don't know how they did it, but they're able to get these other 65, 70-year-olds to come into Zoom meetings and find his lectures, right? We think, oh, our 5,000 followers, that's a great job. Subramanian mm-hmm. Swami has like, I literally like I saw like one Zoom meeting of him, this fucking nut job crazy, but he has like four or five, 600 people coming on to his um, weekly uh, Zoom calls and webinars, right? About mm-hmm. some topic. And I think they have found these nuances and use technology really well. They're doing it mm. the same thing. It's just that we think we're doing it better. They don't have, you know, there's a, there's a gap in it, but they're mm. doing it well. Now I can't say that's all across the board, right? Mm. Of course not. Um, like I said, my Nani just started using an iPad and she does that to listen to budgets, right? Mm. But um, the political class knows exactly what they're doing. So you see, um, my concern does not begin at uh, better or worse, and it does not, um, at least, it does not circumscribe um, winning and losing. My, my my attempt is to understand why, how difficult it is becoming to bring people together in in terms of at least looking at a problem. My 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 deep concern is that when a problem arises, even political, social, whatever, I don't even think people are looking at the same thing. If you see Twitter right now, as far as what's happening in America, it does not look like anybody's interested in talking to each other. People are talking past each other. It's almost like there is two elephants in the room, not one. And for me, as that's engagement in general, right? Imagine, imagine you being in a room with someone you disagree with, regardless of whatever, you know, what you No, I think, I think, I think I significantly disagree with a lot of what you do, but I, and I mean, I set up a club on that premise at Columbia, right? Like I'm very comfortable with that. My, my friendships are born out of something entirely different than agreements and it has come at a cost. So I understand that. But the general point is that it's like, 
whoever is on subramanyam swami's meeting is a stereotype and you can sort of begin to sketch that stereotype you see what i mean we like think so. we think it's a stereotype and maybe hmm. you know hmm. 50% of it will be the 65 year old upper caste uh hindu uh um, you know uh, uncle that is decently well off and now wants to you know hmm. bring back hindustan etc whatever but then then you see you know uh, and i personally seen an art student uh hmm. in new york that secretly attends his you know meetings and stuff and thinks of him as a you know huge nationalist and he's doing this great so, stuff so okay okay now we are at something right the very fact that there could be like such a massive contrast between these two individuals the fact that there is some central node that ties these two people together a version of a problem that both of them resonate with but we have no concept of on the outside you and i like it is hard for me to imagine that that art student and that 65 year old uncle are making close to zero sense there is some sense they're making there is some problem they are sensing there is something it might not be enough to warrant the kind of actions that they're doing post that but it is not like people hear something and they get brainwashed they go back check with their experience come back and they're like oh you know what this kind of makes theoretical sense of my practical problem in the background and i think it is exactly this n times complication where it is so difficult i have to understand a new language every time i'm meeting somebody from outside my domain and i think this makes the functioning of large societies already so diverse like india excessively difficult like i don't understand a way forward if i cannot even know what sweat and noob and bot means like how do i talk to my cousin you see what i mean does that make sense no it doesn't because here's the thing um and you've heard this before um mm-hmm. and i again i came into this conversation with a political lens right that mm-hmm. perspective um right. so the personal is political so when you say that divide about how to the outside world they're not making sense but to them they're making sense right that sense is developed and derived from you know whatever misplaced or placed political identity that they have of themselves and either it's victimization or reclaimment or whatever it is mm-hmm. um that they find that you know really what vibes with them so regardless of what the experiences of the 65 year old is or this you know you know young art school design it's that it makes sense to them and that's what it matters right at the end right. of the day it's not something that we kind of cuz we'll uh, i yeah, as but if a, you try to solve a problem right like so when when we got earlier in the conversation we were at a point where you were like so you were trying to solve a problem differently i'm trying to solve the problem differently and i think the way i'm trying to solve the problem would include like i cannot imagine a way where there is no way i can tell my dad he's wrong but prove to him that he's wrong it will just never happen there has to be an element where there, there has to be one page that him and i meet on in terms of our political views so then we can build a, a vision from there you see what i mean like h- how you cannot alienate 50% of the society in either direction if you're trying to solve a problem and i understand that there is a built in power dynamic and it's unfair i get that part but that still there is i don't see a way forward without some amount of um some amount of overlap you see like there has to, am i making sense now right so so i think what you really hit on is creating that that bridge or that mm-hmm. that i think commonality between how do you instead of so here's my thing here's here's my anecdote to this and i think we kind of discussed this um in mm-hmm. our last podcast is that we live in very very strong silos especially as students right we come to university and then especially south asians and desis they like to live in their academic circles like oh ye theory ye literature let's you know pat ourselves on the back etc um and we never go beyond that and if that is questioned we either resort to shaming or we resort mm-hmm. to excluding them right mm-hmm. and like oh like this that and the whole concept of cancel culture which we let's not get into uh, by any means right. um right but that is the the onset of the problem as well is that that we define ourselves into these categories again because we like to hear ourselves um whatever is happening and we while we like to and i guess we i'm defining as someone that i politically identify as a liberal right i think um, i do i do too i'm i'm extremely liberal the more uh, i look into it, the more i find that to be the case and i see that my political ideology and the members who follow it while we give very broad you know accepting acceptances and identity we still fail miserably to bridge 
gaps, right? Because we're too focused on shaming. We're too focused on proving. No, up- I don't think that's the problem. I think we're not articulating the problem properly is the problem. You see what I mean? So, I mean, how do you like articulate that racism is a problem better? No, 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 no. Of course, racism is a problem. Or, or no, that no, is no, how no, you articulate it. Yeah, no, or xenophobia, or, you know, how do you define that there is like, so obviously there is like, maybe it's not a problem then. What we're thinking about. So for example, Mm-hmm. Again, I'm going back to these anecdotes because it, please I, do, please do. Um, I, you know, did this for a long time. This BPSO, Bhagwan Barsharan, you know, Seva organization, whatever it's called. I don't know. Like um, all these very feisty young Brahmins who have this misplaced identity. But then for them, it's they're doing social good. But then, oh, we cater to everyone, right? That they accept people of other castes. And that's their benevolent idea of what they're doing. And then they're going to actively go and like serve like some community in need, et cetera, all that kind of like how the RSS does it right now Mm. in any shape or form, I would want to like shame both of these organizations, but for their community, for the people that are watching, people are like, shit, you're doing a really good job. Us not recognizing that their community is plotting them on the back, regardless of what their ideological misplaced uh, identities are that we disagree with. We have to go back to the common like denominator is that there is acceptance for this. Maybe not necessarily for that political identity, but for the work that it's doing. What is RSS doing for that one person that I cannot do? Because if I'm not serving him, I'm not going to be able to bring him together, right? You see, like there is but some that need that's being served. But that person depends on like, what do you like, you know, your podcast won't help someone in Kerala who needs aid right now, right? Of course not. Um, so that's what the RSS is doing, right? Mm, Providing right, right. that aid. Um, and uh, yeah, it is, um, I, at the end of the day, it is all politically motivated, um, mm-hmm. I would assume. And uh, I'm not for the, for the RSS, but that is exactly what they're doing. Okay, let me shoot a theory past you. Tell me what you think, right? I think for a lot of Indians, what the BJP and the RSS are facilitating is a sense of pride that they've been missing for long enough. They've been working their asses for decades and they've managed to make a country that can at least stand on its own to whatever extent it can, right? And they had to live with the system not caring for them for over 10, 12 years until somebody came and they were like, I will make you feel proud about yourself. Which, by the way, you cannot deny your demographic the need for a central narrative. It is as essential, right? 100%, but are we clarifying that they're still not taking care of them? They're just giving them a misplaced identity of pride. Absolutely, all of that is up for debate. I'm not making a claim on what they're doing or not doing with this statement that I'm making. All I'm saying is that is the need they're serving. Now, if I go to my dad and like, you were wrong, and he's going to be like, 50 years of feeling shame for being me. I can finally feel pride in it. What is the shame of being him? Being Indian? He was shameful? Like, Sudanshu, let's be absolutely bloody real. Part of the reason why people shit on you when you're in India is because they're ashamed of themselves when they look at you. They see the caricature of what they want to be. You know, like, let you, if you're telling fair and lovely, learn English. Do you understand how much shame the Indian, the middle class Indian has carried for the last 30 years? When they look at you, they think, oh, if I keep doing what I'm secretly doing, this is what I look like because you were born and raised here, right? And then they have this feeling of alienation towards you. This is like, if you're telling me an Indian hasn't felt shamed for being themselves, there are so many guys who tell me, how do I speak better in English? And I'm like, how does it bloody fucking matter? So I got... I'm just trying to understand that shame that, you know, people have been carrying um, for the, let's say Mm -hmm. you're saying the past 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is some, like what you're referring to is like social shame, right? Yeah. What you're saying, the fair fair and lovely. um, All of that is symptoms of self-love. Education. um, Bollywood, dude. Bollywood selling you, fetishized. Yeah. Yeah, So you're saying that that social shame translates into political identity in trying to reclaim a pride. But yes. But what my thing is is we're still not reclaiming in that I not, I I've never not in the material sense. We're, like we're not dark, reclaiming, let's say dark and lovely, because the left is reclaiming that, not the you know, the middle class. Because mm-hmm. regardless of how many, you know, Instagram posts you'll talk about shaming fair fair skin, et cetera, whatever. Every Indian household will still have a fair and lovely like packet oh, on there. By all means, by all <laughs> means. But, but but every time somebody says Hindustan ki jai or whatever Akhand Bharat bloody X Y Z A B C, what is really happening? Bharat is, Mata ki. Right, like you know, right. But the the the, the whole 
they might not be materially doing it as long as people can see that there is an uh, let's say a hinduification around them that's happening but what does that help them in learning better english or fair and lovely how does it get them fair oh it does not it does not get them fair like if you um, so uh, there is a there is a particular brand of hindu who's in america that's deeply conservative and not in like just a i love trump kind of way deeply conservative as an in indic conservative mm-hmm. right and they are the ones who will fight this fair and lovely and english speaking thing more loudly and you know i might be that kind of brand like there might be some residue in me for that but the way it is being resolved for 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 indians they don't really care about the fair and lovely and the english thing yet what they care about is feeling pride in being able to say that i'm indian i'm hindu that is the central psychological need the more tangible connect uh, so mm-hmm. in my head what you're describing there's a disconnect and <laughs> and i guess maybe i i i i lack to understand it is that <laughs> you're equating again fair and lovely this that but that that fight for dark right. and lovely or the fight right. for that is being taken place by the non hindu majority demographic etc it's being done by those activists out there it's being done right. by liberals like us it's being like out there so i just don't know how that automatically maybe you know those are two really bad examples if you can help me with other anecdotes maybe you know uh, but let's let, let, instead of getting lost in the semantics of the equation what i'm trying to get at is there is so much fracture and this fracture is so deeply hidden that it is for i am finding it extremely difficult every time i talk to a new demographic to be able to find a way to bring them in there seems to be almost there seems to be almost there, there seems to be very little way of talking to each other in our times and i think a lot of it is facilitated by generational chasms and you don't you don't think so no I 100% think so. Um mm-hmm. I that's literally my life's work. Um it's the fact and actually Thank God I feel safe now. I was like we have entered weird territory talking here. <laughs> Thank God. No, uh I my right. I think I my work takes another layer. It's that mm-hmm. it's not just the conversations we're having because conversations, you know, you can work on, you can talk about, you can have bridge building exercises and organizations, but what that also means is that a political class that is in power to make policies that majority prescribe and affect a class that isn't in that generational ideology and what you're talking about that those gulfs that occur then is a huge deal because the policies that they're making impact a generation in the most negative way um and what you know people might not understand in terms of the reality of how we're suffering but at the same mm-hmm. time we also have to think about and this is going back to the conversation that we don't need to explore any further mm-hmm. but knowing that there is a generational gap there's intergenerational conflict for sure which we talk about right but then within that generation there's also conflict right because it's not just one sided like we were referring right, right. to right so right, right. yes so that that's the thing this generation that precedes us mm. or maybe two generations that precedes us that are, that's making policy you can say and i would 100% agree that they're not making policies for a majority demographic young people right mm. that are productive and beneficial right because of the chasms that exist but at the mm. same time they're also making policies that prescribe for some generation that 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 are within us members of our generation that are within us because they do prescribe by that ideology they still go with it maybe it won't help them but they prescribe by it and for mm-hmm. us to completely and that's something that we really focus on at YF and Young India Foundation is you know i i'm asked many times is first of all why are you you know nonpartisan like you should be supporting someone to go against like let's say the bjp because that is the common hatred right in mm-hmm. 2013 2010 bubble by was the congress now it's the bjp um why aren't you going against them you know getting progressive candidates but the whole idea was is that our issue is that there is political uh a political news around young people that news isn't brought by just one party or the other it's brought by the left it's brought by the moderates it's brought by the you know the the right we need to get young people regardless of whatever political ideology they come from to be able to overcome those hurdles so i mm-hmm. have you know and it's also what i believe is your political identity is very contextual right mm-hmm. we are working at a panchayat sarpanch at a municipality level right so rakar i can talk to you about you know how i 100% agree 
and support that there needs to be a better transgender um, law that is prescribed within our policies and mandates at a national level and that you know devolves down to a local level. I can talk to you about how Article 377 um, and you know the decriminalization was probably one of the most influential things of our generation that's occurred, right? Mm-hmm. Talking about homosexuality for a punch candidate in or sarpanch candidate in Haryana, uh, it, especially in Agao, has nothing to do with him at all, right? Or her, right? right? And to do that, to create that conversation at that level, actually hinders the growth that we could make at another level. So if we create right. a substandard for all our candidates and say, "Hey, you're a progressive candidate. You need to be this. You need to be this. You need to be this. You need to be this," then a, I'm not going to have any successful candidates, right? Because we're not understanding our voter base, right? Mm-hmm. One thing that we get is, "Oh, you deal with caste. Of course, we deal with caste. We're not class blind." The whole thing about this is so funny. You know, I have liberals. Uh, Instagram woke people talking about how no one is, you know, colorblind, like you saying, I don't see color, et cetera, right? Because that's what's happening right now in this situation is people need to stop seeing that they don't see color because obviously color is a reality. Same thing with cast. You can't say that you're cast blind, that you don't see cast. That's such bullshit. And I see this coming from like the upper cast, the elite, urban elite, like, oh, I don't see cost, bro. Like, like everything you exist, everything you exist, everything. And even in your daily lives, you have become so nuanced with just like it becoming so customized that you don't even like understand, but everything is. Yes. So, sorry, going back to what my statement is, is I get like a lot of like, oh, like, you know, what is this about you're talking about this? That's the only way we can actually have candidates. Right. We, that is like political equations one on one. I can't right. go against literally how electoral democracy and caste and society works in India. Of course, I want candidates that won't discriminate on the basis of caste, but right. that doesn't mean that like we have to completely be caste blind. Oh, caste doesn't exist, bro. Like right. this, that, right. whatever. Like you right. need to understand the realities and that's something that we fail to do so, that we mm-hmm. constantly want to create a model of our political ideology and what we believe in, in every way. Everywhere. And yeah. that is the big, and this is on the left and this is on the right. We have to understand that people will not agree with us. People will have different models. But right. the, more, mm-hmm. the more we're trying to build those overlaps, we're, the bridges that we're trying to, then these chasms that are that, that are occurring, let's say people are out in the streets, people are getting their head busted by the NYPD, mm-hmm. their mm-hmm. rights, et cetera. And literally, I thought, you know, there are a lot of people that are coming out against this. There are significantly a lot of outrage and outcry about this. But at the same time, it's truly provoking the right even further as well. Yeah, like, right. in my feed, right? People that you don't expect. Fuck. Uh, Indian female, uh, 25 year old, works at you know a bank, et cetera, is getting so um, worked up about this and is sharing, you know, like this is what the media won't show you. Look at, you know, a policeman being attacked. Right. Like, dude, you are literally the antithesis of what I would expect a conservative person to be in saying blue lives matter, but yes, you're mm-hmm. doing so. Right. Mm. And, you know, she's only posting that in her close friend list. Mm. That is what I'm talking about, is that we are provoking and evoking mm. um, instead of actually trying to build those bridges to where we can actually have collaborative and instances where, yes, these sickening events will happen. But at, as long as it doesn't and shouldn't. Right. Mm-hmm. only evoke the other base stronger that we need to prevent right. this we need to stop this we need to be talking about it but how do we do so in a collaborative manner where the other side is also saying hey that kind of makes sense we shouldn't do right. that. instead right. again you have this nut job president that's oh going gosh. out with the bible out there and provoking invoking and now people are out in the streets you right. had the same thing with amit shah and um kapil mishra doing that in the delhi uh, mm-hmm. situation and people going mm-hmm. out in the streets it's you know, it is this exact similar situation, mm-hmm. but it's the fact that we are also following the same trap. At the end of the day, Rakhar, BGP didn't lose any vote bank doing all that, but it actually increased it. At Neither did Donald Trump. Neither did Donald yeah, Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I won't, you know, I don't know what will happen, but I won't say that, oh my God, Donald Trump, you saw so right. All right? right? Like he is right. vastly popular. He's regenerating right. his base. And we're, Again, in our silos, being happy with people that are posting and saying, oh, yeah, um, and not reaching out. And so, I'm, I'm, I'm also, you know, someone that's, that, that's a culprit in this is that if I have gotten into it beforehand as well, where right. like people are just like, dude, what the, you know, like I, I, I actually did this on purpose is where I re-added my friends from Alabama once I, um, you know, 
unfriended nice. them because I was sick and tired of them. Masochistic. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm just like filling myself with NYU, Oxford, Columbia kids that live in Fire. their own bubbles. And there's this entire identity. And if I want to genuinely be interested in electoral democracy, trying to get young people or regardless of wherever to see what they're thinking, you have to have a variety of, of opinions. This guy that I graduated with, right? And I, was, and I posted this, the gra- guy I graduated from in high school, who now actually works as a teacher in that high school in Alabama, was talking about how, you know, uh, the George Floyd case wasn't a racial instance because there was a Chinese dude that was also a police officer there. And, and the thing was, is that two weeks ago, he made a status about how the coronavirus was a Chinese disease, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So just understanding mm-hmm. that they're very skewed perspective, very problematic right. perspective, a shit perspective. Um, also exist and people are liking. And the thing is, is that person is a teacher in a high school where mm. his opinion is also going to be interlaced with the people, you know, that are going out there. So the people exist like that. Right. And, and so he, before I forget, before I forget, yeah, you, I, I have so much to agree and disagree with. I think there's going to be enough. So, uh, and why I'm excited is because I think I finally understood why I reached out to have this conversation with you. And uh, bear with me. So the first thing that you're very right about is that politics is not all morals. It's also tact. Right. Like you have to be practical about shit. You cannot just be like, oh, everything's beautiful in this utopia that I can imagine. Right. The second thing that I think why, why is, is that after this happens in New York City, after this happens all across America, I cannot bring myself to believe that this is not a pattern that I that I cannot bring myself to believe that there is there is a common voice that is being lost in our fancy democratic architectures that is being represented through violence everywhere from Paris to Hong Kong, to New Delhi, to Chile, to Lebanon, to, to New Delhi, to like, I think something's up. And I, I, I think that is what I intuitively realized when, when I was thinking about this was that you were right, that the, you cannot have a 65 year old be in direct governance of a 23 year old that he just absolutely cannot un- like the 23 year old needs a representative. That's his age that understands what the right. bloody hell is happening. And, and before like all the trolls come at us, just clarify one thing. It's not mm-hmm. that we're saying that parliament should be a daycare with only 25 year olds. Right. Right. Of uh, course. 60% of, you know, we're not saying like a proportion to, uh, uh, ratio of like 60% of everyone should be below the age of 25 in parliament. What we are saying is that it's fine in mm. a certain level, if the you know prime minister is 70, 68, et cetera, much larger than the demographic. But at the same time, there needs to be a significant increase of representation of age demographics below. So that 25-year-old or that 21-year-old or that 30-year-old, um, and many of those can represent different aspects. So just clarify that for, for all the viewers. Mm-hmm. It's not that we're saying, okay, let's do, because I don't even agree. I don't even agree at all with a retirement age, right? People are like, oh yeah, retirement age, that's like the, everyone does it. No, like at the end of the day, you cannot, um, if you're truly liberal, if you really think about political participation and representation, you can't prescribe ages or barriers to participate. That's what democracy is about. It's that regardless of your caste, class, creed, and age, you need to be able to participate. And yes, it's been lopsided. And the mm-hmm. fact that the the ones with the best um, and most privilege have been able to participate more, whether it's politically, societally, et cetera, whatever, and benefit off of it. That is where, you know, the equity happens, where we're trying to provide more resources for those in the underprivileged, or in our case, in terms of lower ages to get access to that. Mm-hmm. But the, the larger issue is that anyone should be able to participate. That's what we need. But when we say anyone needs to be able to participate, it's because their representation matters, their thought process, their ideas, where they come right. from at the end of the day. So a 25-year-old, multiple 25-year-olds need to be in parliament. They need right. to be making law. They need to be getting their voice heard. And they need to understand, and not just in parliament, in all political functionary. We need young people to be, you know, being in party politics and being in these uh political positions and then that's this is why we focus on a local level because it's much easier to do it so but it's a larger proven case think about it this way i don't know how much you're into law but um basically the way that our uh, our, our constitution is structured that the most empowered level of governance is, is actually at the local level so you have you know incredible things like renewable energy to you know um uh, let's say uh, uh, the money, like, right, yeah. etc. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to give is like everything that surrounds our daily lives, the food that I will eat, 
uh, the way that I will transport myself, the way that I will get income is actually in the hands of the local level governance, right? And yet we pay the least amount of attention to it. So we're trying to empower young people because at the end of the day, the majority demographic is young. So as a representative, I have more power to affect your life, Brucker, if I'm at a local level position, right? And I cannot necessarily make policies, but ensure that governance is more adept and more prescribed to you and your mm-hmm. generation at a local level than I can by making swat large sweeping you know, political statements. And that's what I have a huge issue with because we have some uh, politicians at a national level that love to put private member bills, right? And I'm not going to mm-hmm. name them. Um, mm-hmm. I should shame them. But um, they do it because it's article headlines. They do it because, oh, look at me, I'm liberal, I'm so progressive. But mm-hmm. they also know that these private member bills will never see the daylight because A, mm. they've put their name against it. And if they're coming from different parties, the main government won't accept it. Private mm. member bills, there's only been one private member bill that's been accepted in the history of India, right? One, right? Um, and that was in like the 1960s. So private member bills are just a way to get tabled to get their identities. And everyone, all these progressive or like, oh, modern- So private private member bills are like anonymous? Uh, anonymous no, no, they're not anonymous. It's like a politician can put his name in. It's like a table. But private member bills are not, let's say through a- sponsored by a party, a coalition, or by the government. It's just tabled by individuals. Those, you know, and again, it's a headline grabbing opportunity for these politicians, Mm -hmm. Um, but it never means that it's actually going to be applied. So, you know, and the, 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 the thing I was saying was, is you can have like these headline grabbing moments, oh, whatever, but it doesn't mean shit for people that are actually in need of it. That's where the local level positions come in, whether you're an MC, whether you're, you know, an actual mayor, whether you're a Sarpanch, you're a Panch, Jila Parishad, where you can actually prescribe whatever we have or work with our institutions to efficiently Mm. better prescribe to your identity, your needs and your problems. Right. I think, and so to clarify what you're saying, I'm with you on that, right? I'm definitely not saying like, that's an unreasonable thing to say that everybody should be young in the parliament. But here's the deal. There is so much complexity in the youth and it is only insulated and it is only going to grow as we go that we need to have a representation of at least the understanding of that complexity. Like my dad has no concept of how complex my social media reality, my virtual reality is. You see what I mean? And I, and you eventually you need people to represent the kind of, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not just my lifestyle is pretty represented, but you, you, you understand what I'm trying to say. There's, there's, there's a, there's a complex variety of needs that need to be served in the parliament that absolutely go unrepresented because there is a statute to the effect, right? I, I, I agree, but I just want to like expand that not just in parliament, but assemblies, mm-hmm. and right. local levels, the need leadership, at that level, representation. Don't even call it leadership. leadership. Don't call it okay. politics. Call right. it representation because at the end of the day, that's what it is. So tell me about, tell me why is Tejasvi Surya and Raghav Chadda, who are young enough, not like, wh- where do they fall in this idea bracket? Look, Tejasvi Surya, Raghav Chadda, uh, Kanahiya Kumar, um, Sheila Raj, Hardik Pandey, right. Uh, these are all not youth leaders, they're figureheads. They're not youth representatives. You know, they are, oh, look at me, I'm young on the basis of whatever. But at right. the end of the day, they have no decision-making process, uh, ability to do so. You know, Raghav Chadda is, Raghav Chadda is now Delhi Jal Board, right? Resident, mm-hmm. and he's doing, you know, his CA stuff. Oh, he looks cute. He'll post on Instagram as Delhi Burns, right? Um, and then, you know, when it was time for when he was then, he was like being liberal, progressive, and now it's just silent. The Jesse Suri is a nut job. Right. Mm. Um, but again, he's pandering to his base, right. Which right. people love him for. So you can't deny right. that he doesn't exist as an, a, as a identity for them, but he will never go against or never will actually produce anything, you know, conducive in parliament that goes against, because he, again, he's worried about his next ticket. His, mm. auto ticket milgi, his political career is now then now he needs to think about the next. Mm. That's the whole thing is that we, you know, we get so wrapped into the whole concept of politics. Like it can hear Kumar. Social media, great, great job. But what have you truly done? And I have a huge problem with a lot of these. Um, I guess maybe that's where our ideology differs at that point. Um, is that I think we need to stop focusing on just trying to make a youth identity, youth leader, right? Because everyone loves trying to do that. We need to make sure that we're creating more youth leaders, not trying to make ourselves a youth leader and youth identity. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what Kanahiya Kumar has done. That's what, um, you know, Sheila Rashad has done. That's what the Jessu Surya is doing. Um, what I would have appreciated more 
is that Ganhaya ensures that, at, you know, with his political capital that he had, instead of him getting his own ticket and losing pretty badly, um, mm-hmm. is trying to ensure that other young people um, have the ability to get those tickets too, mm-hmm. um, to be able to actually come out and represent in these mainstream parties, right? Mm-hmm. We need a movement not led by a youth figure. We need mm-hmm. a movement for youth empowerment in different areas. So my ideally, all of these people coalesce right? That would be ideal. Coalesce, bring together and ensure and put pressure in their different parties. Mm. So Tejasu Surya puts pressure on the BJP. uh, Raga Chara puts pressure on the AAP. um, You know, there are a few for Congress, etc. And and Kanaya Kumar does it on the left, etc. To make sure that in their political functioning, in the tickets that they give, etc., that they have more youth representation and youth identity than that. But will they ever do so? No, because they're more concerned about making an identity about themselves. They're more concerned about getting that book deal. They're more concerned about, oh, I'm going to hit 100,000 uh, Instagram followers, right? Mm-hmm. That is what they're more concerned about. And mm-hmm. obviously, the underlying notion is, oh, how do I win my next election, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think, so if you take the Jesu Surya out of the BJP, do you think the Jesu Surya would win next time? No. Mm. And that's a failure of not just him, but his ability um, to actually encourage youth leadership. Um, Tell me something. Yeah. Can you, uh, if I were to say, and I'm, I'm just playing a strong devil's advocate, but I'm, I realize that I can sit back and allow myself to look at things a certain way because, you know, privilege. You can not put skin in the game for your own self. You cannot vie for, for stuff for your own self because, well, privilege, you know. W- w- my my question is, could it not be that you can distance yourself and be like, okay, I'm going to help others do it because you already have enough. And these people are, are, are they don't like Hardik. I mean, I can see somebody being like, you know what? I don't also, know if somebody else. Hardik Pandya, it's Hardik Pandya. <laughs> oh, Hardik Pandya is the cricketer? Yeah. See how little I care about cricket. <laughs> my bad. I wanted, to, Hardik, I wanted to say that, but then you said it like you always did Hardik and I was like, by the way. <laughs> Uh, my bad, bro. My bad. I, I heard he, him and his wife are recently pregnant. So congratulations. Oh, okay. To that. Look at you consuming all that pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> it shows up on my Facebook, man. It shows up on my Facebook. You know? <laughs> That's my silo. Uh, but tell me. Uh, so, like, is it is it is it as easy? Like, would you say? Because my my point is okay. I understand this on a whole different level, not just by, b- because of this conversation, but because I've been you know, slowly inching my way forward, making sure that I understand stuff. And I'm going to take it to say all the other conversations I have. In fact, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody where I was talking pretty much about the same thing from a different lens. How do I get the common man to give a fuck? Like not me, but how does the common man contribute to it? My point is the common man can very easily be like, oh, so Danshu can do this because he has a time in the means and he has no, you know, he doesn't want to really do something for himself and blah, blah, blah. He's probably already, you know, had everything phone down. How do I get uh, how does a, how does somebody else give a shit about this? What is the well, te- what is, I, huh? no, no no? So here's the thing. Um, there's always people, you know, like me that have had privilege, um, that have an, I would say, a duty of sorts uh, to ensure that we are basically make ensuring that the privilege that we have um, isn't for just our own serving purposes. It's for making sure that we can devolve that, right? And empower mm-hmm. other people. So what the people that you're saying, and that's exactly what Young India Foundation does, right? Mm-hmm. It's that people that are in urban India that have the ability to do free internships and get to an organization that can talk about politics can help people who take the risk of getting into politics, but necessarily don't have the resources, the ideas, and the ability to actually contest by themselves, right? Mm. And that's what we're saying. So the expectation is not everyone needs to become, let's say, only a leader or become someone that's actually, you know, profiling and getting other young people to get in. It's, again, you need the ability to become a representative that we want to hopefully help you do. And that's the ideology that we prescribe by but mm. also, it's the fact that it's okay if you can't, right? Mm. But the only thing is, is that you need to stand up. Because those that what you're saying is, oh, I don't have the time. I don't have the ability. I don't have the capacity to do this. That's- or I just, I just am not like, you have to factor in the fact that no matter how, how much I say is somebody's privilege, they, like you can only escape your psychological proximity so much, right? So I don't care is also on the table. You know what I mean? Like if somebody listens and to there us, are people. like, Right. So, but like, so the best possible way to solve that would be to give people a low investment way of giving a fuck about it. Because that's then that's exactly like, what we're right. doing, right? That's okay, exactly right. what. So, for example, I know this guy mm-hmm. who literally is the most apolitical person uh, mm-hmm. ever, 
right? Um, he's from Chandigarh, which is also a very apolitical city because they don't give a fuck because they all have privilege, right? They have a very efficient- That's a city of privilege. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously. And then mm. you have him, he's Punjabi, and the Urta Punjab situation um, was- so like you say- what do you and mean? He's Urta like, no, no, like, no, 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 and he's really into Bollywood, right? And he was like, this needs to stop. And this is the most apolitical person I've ever known, right? And he, he gets wanted so what to stop? riled up. The, basically the censorship. Like, oh, it okay. up at one point was stop. Couldn't release this, that, et cetera. So he was like, this needs to stop. This is it. And he is furious. And ever since then, ever since Urta Punjab, that was his political awakening. Mm. It's not that he understands all the proximities of local level leadership and maybe even censorship laws, rules, regulations. He's like, this government or any government cannot stop Bollywood movies for, and, and needs to stop censoring them for their political gains. And right. that is why he puts pressure on the government, right? Now, <laughs> so yes, people won't care um, about... Until, right. Until it's something hits them personally, right? Which Right. I believe everything is political, right? Mm -hmm. But yes, we can't expect everyone to care mm -hmm. about migrants. We can sh obviously, you know, pressurize, shame them, talk about it as much as we can. But for other people, other things work, right? And mm -hmm. that's where they get really, truly invested. So I know this guy from Delhi, really well off, um, cars, you know, restaurants, that's his lifestyle, right? <laughs> um, and yeah. yet, you know, the business that he owns when it came under political regulations, that's when he got really politically invested, mm. right? He's like, Nini, ye karna, wo karna, et cetera, whatever. That is his political bias showing in. And then he's like, oh, this government sucks. Oh, this, this, that, et cetera. Mm. Again, we're all personal in that perspective. And the whole idea is if I started shaming him saying, oh, this, I would have alienated him, right? Mm. And he would have never prescribed that. But now he understands the significance of how much politics is. Right. Um, and that is, and that is, that is essentially why I am so bent on bringing, um, I like 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 creating a thread where everybody can attach to and understand that there is a problem. There is no deny. If at this point we are denying that there is not a problem, then we are not looking at things properly, right? And so um, that is precisely what I mean. I um, and I I have a different notion. I think the political is personal, and I mean we don't have to get into that. But it's 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 um, it's an inversion of what the common idea is. And I believe in, in in where you're coming from too, but I also think people, bloody fuck it. Uh, but I, I, I just am curious if somebody had to reach out to Young India Foundation and find the most, the cheapest way of being a part of it. So they could at least, instead of putting a black tile on Instagram, they could do something more tangible. Yeah. How would they do that? Do an internship become our eyes and ears on the ground, right? So we just created what's called the YF Local Representatives. And what we want to do is you spend three hours of your week working for YF, all in your week, right? And all you have to do is tell us when there are elections happening at a district level, are there any young candidates that are taking place and mm. do uh, certain youth empowerment events, right? I'm just saying, right? So mm. what that does is it makes an eye and uh, eyes grin. So when, let's say, because there's no way when we can know at a local level when elections are happening. So they're not announced like at a state, national level, like, oh, whatever. Right. These things happen literally on a daily basis. You have, you know, uh, a state that's going under panchayat elections, but then also two cities in urban local bodies that are going through elections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? right. So you have all this that kind of is created um, and and is works, right? So that's something that we've done. We are trying to make sure that, you know, you are a lawyer, right? You don't have time, but you're in, let's say, Bhopal, right? Let us know when the elections are happening, let us know when there is a young candidate that's coming about or trying to seek and obviously raise awareness about youth empowerment within your local level. That's all they need to do. You mm -hmm. are being active in politics and being passionate about youth empowerment if you're doing exactly that. So I genuinely believe that, you know, politics or representation shouldn't be a career. Um, mm -hmm. It should be part and parcel of who we are, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that we try to model at Young India Foundation is that you don't have to leave your career. You don't have to like devote this much time, et cetera make it part of your life. And that's exactly what we are doing. So our goal is, is to fill all like 1200 or slash districts um, of, of India with a YF local representative. Um, 
and you know see see how it goes down what is your strategy if i want to make i want to convince older people of this being legitimate right like if i would be like what, what do you tell them like how do you bring them in the fold so i think you know there's two things one is that um it's not old people right there's older. a subsect of old people that are arrogant right, right? a you lot know. of old people <laughs> actually are like yo we need more young people i've mm. met so many people that say no this makes sense but the problem is when they say young people they mean rahul gandhi and who the hell no 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 rahul gandhi is not young no no they That's exactly what i mean you know like, they their standard trying, of youth is that their standard yeah, of youth is no, rajiv okay, gandhi so, when you so, use so it, that you know? that is a whole another level of basically psychological societal issues within india of what we think youth i have met people and literally been introduced like oh yeah i'm at a youth leader and it and it's like a father of three kids and i'm just like do you understand that 670 million people are below the age of 25 Do you really say that? <laughs> you no, know, I'm I like I mean like I do you chaser lock. You know like you like do you think about that, right? That's how many people are below the age of uh, of 25 and you're saying that this 35-year-old is a youth leader and he needs and deserves He leader. lost his youth with the first baby he had. The first time he lost his first his youth when he turned 25 or 29 etc. like 35-year-old ha huh, you wah hai 40-year-old you wah like all these parties <laughs> the BJP you wah morcha uh the uh, indian youth congress their youth presidents are 43 44 like dude that's like my dad isn't they, that insulting huh? isn't that insulting to the youth leader matlab usko log seriously nahi lete honge people will be like you are young stay away like no because I, no uh, because there's a hierarchy right because he is the president then you'll have all these like uh, you know everyone all part, it, there's no distinction they're all the same bjp hmm. congress left etc they all say yes men blah 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 ha 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 whatever and no 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 one will actually raise a voice it's mm-hmm. like you know where we get screwed uh when we're talking about these issues and trying to like you know bring them to light and and no one really like we get basically combated by by both sides mm-hmm. um all sides actually because mm-hmm. we're talking about these you know like hypocrisies and 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 trying to see like dude this is a societal issue right we have a very limited understanding of age and of right. young people and youth empowerment we think right. it's youth empowerment again for example saying rahul gandhi is a young leader i've heard right. narendra modi say, uh, people say narendra modi no, is no 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 don't go we there talk, we we talk about you know <laughs> and one thing that i've said uh, i've heard and and um i'm going to have to go um huh. but one thing <laughs> i was in basically um a part of of up that connects with haryana it's like right post um um yamnanagar and uh-huh. saharanpur if you've ever heard of uh-huh. yeah 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 and um there was like these like collection of like people we, i was doing some like activity for young india foundation and this is right after 2017 yogi was elected etc and um they were talking about how yogi's youth which whatever he's a young, one of the younger you know cms etc and um he go they go on about all this stuff and we started debating and it was like a bunch of like you know um uh, people playing tash etc and they're like look at modi he's also young fit he's active har din you know uh, desh mein jaate hain in bharat ke ye karte hain etc and that is something that we also know um is that the concept of young in india especially in rural india is actually equated Beautiful. and synonymous for fit active vigorous right um right. maybe even vigorous right but fit yeah. active yeah. this that etc so so it's interesting that you know we have different parallels of of what we're thinking and considering as youth and that is actually one of the significant issues and hurdles that we have is i'm so revolutionary to these people when i say we need a 21 year old like to be in parliament and decrease the age of candidacy and they're like oh we want youth empowerment but 45 year old chalega a 40 year old chalega right so right. to me to to them, them i'm radical in that right. in mm-hmm. instance um and that's saddening and i think mm-hmm. hopefully maybe later on we can continue this conversation because for sure I, for sure you need to leave huh yeah i need to leave i didn't know this would last so first of all either give me some questions that i can prepare huh. and we can like actually have structure or two give me a time limit and say do ghante whatever you yaar bro the conversation carried on organically i was having so much fun can you can you deny the fact that you had fun i it was terrible i hated right? every little right? bit <laughs> acha <laughs> when you, i don't even know you, huh? i don't even know the relationship we share because we're just roasting each other <laughs> together like what is <laughs> it this is this is called a healthy sense of competition sadanshu
Dude, I want no competition with no, your babagiri. Huh. We never got to that. We your never got to that. podcast, I want no competition. You, no, no, you know, as brothers, you, we, as brothers, we can take on the. No, no, I don't want any of your male gigolo Nothing. competition from Delhi. I just think that it's so my, fun. My family watches that. this. My family watches this. Come on. Oh, so do you want to? I, <laughs> uncle, auntie, namaskar. Um, Chal, you can leave. Um, uh, just press stop recording, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for anybody who was here. Thank you so much. Take